Hello everyone, I'm Vicki Healy at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is co-hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center and CLASP. Today we will examine U.S. water efficiency standards and how these standards can inform worldwide CO2 reductions. Uh, before we begin, I have one important note to mention, which is the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar will be featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practice resources that are reviewed and selected by our technical experts. So our agenda, before we begin our presentations, I will go over some of the webinar features and provide an overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. We will then proceed with presentations by Ms. Megan Geis from the Appliance Standards Awareness Project, followed by Ms. Marie Baton from CLASP, and then uh, Mr. Matt Malinowski, also from CLASP. Following the presentations, we will take uh, some time to address your questions from the audience. And after the webinar concludes, uh, you will see a short survey pop up on your screen. And we thank you in advance for taking time to give us some feedback on this webinar. A few things to know before we begin. Uh, for audio, you have two options. You may listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio box. If you want to dial in by phone, select the telephone option and a box on the right side of your screen will display the telephone number and an audio pin. A gentle reminder to our panelists to please mute your audio when you are not presenting. Also, please note we um, uh, will be providing uh, information on the, uh, the materials following the webinar. So to illustrate the features a bit more clearly, we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this in the upper right corner of your screen. Um, questions, you can submit text questions to the presenters by typing your questions into the questions panel. And you can send your questions in at any time. We will collect these and uh, our presenters will respond to them during the Q&A session. So also a reminder uh, to our attendees, when you submit your question, we ask that you include the name of the presenter you are addressing your question to. Uh, today's event is being recorded. So if you would like to review the webinar or share this information with others, an audio recording will soon be posted to the Solution Center YouTube channel and to our website at the links provided on this slide. Also, you will receive an email tomorrow uh, with a link to access the webinar recording. Uh, now, a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, what we're all about. Uh, the Solutions Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial, and the Solutions Center is structured to help governments design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This help is provided through an Ask an Expert Technical Assistance Service, which is offered to governments free of charge, and it is designed to allow experts to respond quickly to questions. The Solution Center also engages in capacity building activities, um, such as the webinar you are attending today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. First up uh, today, we will have um, Ms. Megan Geis, a policy associate at the Appliance Standards Awareness Project, where she conducts research on water using appliances and works to advance appliance standards at the state level. Following Megan, we will hear from Marie Baton, the Europe Climate Lead at CLASP. Marie specializes in international product regulations and labeling and has extensive experience in energy efficiency sector. And our third presenter today is Mr. Matt Malinowski, a senior manager on the climate team at CLASP where he leads CLASP impact modeling efforts, contributes to program design and implementation, and brings robust technical, analytical, and policy skills to the climate team. And with those brief introductions complete, we will now move on to the presentations. Megan, uh, over to you. Hey, thank you. I'm gonna show my screen here. All right. 
Oops, let's go back. Hi, good morning. Um, today I am going to talk about state level appliance efficiency standards and how they can help um, meet water and energy efficiency goals. Uh, let's start with a little background on state standards. Appliances use energy and water. We want them to use less energy and water. The US federal government sets some standards on products like air conditioners and dishwashers, and no state can set a more aggressive standard than the feds. We say that these appliances are preempted and states can't touch them. In some cases, the federal government hasn't weighed in on a product, and then states are free to set their own standards. In other cases, notably for water using products, the Obama administration explicitly waived federal preemption, meaning that even though there's a federal water using standard that everyone has to adhere to, states can set their own standards that are more stringent. Federal regulations apply to the manufacture and import of products, but if a state sets standards on an appliance that's not preempted, that means that no retailers or manufacturers within a state are allowed to sell appliances that use more energy or water than the state specifies. Um, for plumbing products, that is shower heads, faucets, toilets, and urinals, are, and a few others which are outside the federal government scope, that is spray sprinkler bodies, commercial steam cookers, commercial dishwashers, and landscape irrigation controllers, are what I'll be focusing on today. Setting standards at a state level for these products can save millions of gallons of water per year, as well as energy from reduced water heating and energy from secondary energy use, that is, pumping and wastewater treatment. For those of you who may be new to the topic, reducing the amount of water that needs to be heated every time someone takes a shower makes a big impact on energy savings and carbon dioxide reduction here in the US. Uh, the focus on water using products today is very important because whether you're interested in energy or water conservation, faucets and shower heads are in the top five energy and money saving products for which states can set standards. Water efficiency is also less of a partisan issue in, in many states, and this is demonstrated by the fact that drought has prompted conservative Texas and Georgia to adopt standards uh, in the last decade. Uh, and though drought isn't a, sorry, excuse me, drought isn't a temporary thing anymore either, um, especially in the West, um, drought is becoming an endemic and persistent threat for many states. And even in the wetter Southeast, Flash droughts are threatening overtaxed riverbeds that feed old and populated metropolitan areas. Um, so water using products are good candidates for state standards because they're not preempted federally or they've had preemption waived. But also because each of these items, for each of these items, there is an existing standard or specification, an existing test method that's tied to a standard or a specification, and there are cost effective savings meaning buying an efficient product is going to benefit the consumer either immediately or in the near future based on energy and water savings. Finally, compliant products are made by a range of manufacturers, so uh, customers aren't forced to buy one brand of toilet, for example, if that's the only efficient one. When we say there's an existing specification or standard, that means that programs like Energy Star or uh, its water saving analog WaterSense have specifications to define an inefficient product from an efficient product. Um, these are voluntary federal programs and, and they're managed as such. Um, but a state can adopt standards um, based on the voluntary federal specification. California's Energy Commission also is a very well-organized and well-funded uh, group, so they often define specifications or standards that other states can emulate. Uh, let's take a closer look at the standards for U.S. hot water fixtures, uh, namely faucets in this slide. The federal standard, the law of the land, states that no kitchen or lavatory faucets can be sold that exceed 2.2 gallons per minute flow rate, and I have liters per minute here on this slide as well. Um, that's pretty general, and since faucets are no longer preempted, California has set more stringent standards, <clears throat> excuse me, requiring a maximum flow of 1.8 gallons per minute for kitchen faucets and 1.2 gallons per minute for bathroom or lavatory faucets. WaterSense, the federal government's voluntary specification program, requires that a lavatory faucet not dispense more than 1.5 gallons per minute to earn a WaterSense label on the faucet's packaging. So customers can go into a store 
and look for a WaterSense labeled product. <clears throat> so far, six states have published faucet standards based either on California Energy Commission standards or the EPA's WaterSense standards. ASAP estimates that an signi a significant number of kitchen and lavatory faucet models already meet California or WaterSense specifications. This is good news because it means that customers can find an efficient model uh, easily at any store, and retailers generally need less lead in time before their stock of inefficient products is turned over. <clears throat> Similarly, six states have set more stringent standards than the federal governments for showerheads. California, Hawaii, and Washington are aligned with the, C the California Energy Commission's most stringent standard, which is 1.8 gallons per minute, and Colorado, New York, and Vermont are aligned with the water sense specifications of two gallons per minute. The federal standard is 2.5 gallons per minute. So 73% of shower head models meet water sense specifications of two, point, or, uh, two gallons per minute or less. And of those shower heads that are water sense certified, the EPA reports that 63% have a maximum flow rate of 1.8 gallons per minute or less. Since manufacturers have produced more than 9,000 water sense labeled shower head models to date, this suggests that manufacturers aren't having a tough time meeting or exceeding the most stringent standard that exists in the US. An important component to these standards are test procedures that help define an, an efficient product. <laughs> In addition to meeting the maximum flow rate criteria that I just outlined, test procedures for these specifications include performance criteria. For example, it's really important that efficient shower heads pre prefer, perform well because, at least in the US, people are sensitive about their showers. And if your spec is voluntary, like water senses is, then no one will buy your voluntarily efficient shower head, or worse, the water sense label will lose its value as representative of a good product and it could represent a disappointing product. So for the shower head specification under water sense, the test procedure defines a spray force test where a shower head is set up to spray on an apparatus that looks like the one depicted here. And if the force spray is equal or greater to the counterweight, it will move a force gauge. Um, the result is that high efficiency shower heads are really what quite well liked in the US. Uh, this slide shows the top fit pick from a popular product review website that's owned by the New York Times. Among all the shower heads that this reviewer could have chosen, they found that the best and most satisfying shower head was one that beat even California's most stringent standards of 1.8 gallons per minute. Here we have some photos of a wastewater treatment plant in Longmont, Colorado, pumping water to households and treating wastewater after the water is used. Um, both are processes that use energy. Standards on these cold water appliances could save secondary energy in the form of pumping and wastewater treatment reductions. Um, a 2017 Energy Information Administration report noted that energy embedded in water is roughly 3.5% of current total US annual electricity consumption. So our organization hasn't tried to estimate secondary energy savings that could come from cold water using appliance standards, but these processes do represent a potential avenue for regional or uh, municipal energy savings. Now, if you're in, in the US and you're interested in passing state standards, let me do a quick pitch. ASAP uh, publishes a new model bill every fall. Uh, our 2021 model bill will be likewise published, and this year it looks to be very similar to our 2020 model bill. A copy of the bill is posted on our website for anyone to take a look at, um, and if you're not in the U.S. but you think the language might be helpful to you, uh, feel free to have a look at this too. Uh, our organization can help local advocates in a number of ways, primarily by leveraging our contacts at regional organizations, water and energy advocacy organizations, and in other state governments that have previously passed standards. We provide technical assistance, analysis, and any other kinds of materials. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, had some really good momentum going this year before the COVID-19 crisis. Ten states were pursuing standards, but most were put on hold when state legislatures pass, uh, paused their sessions. However, we still have a number of advocates in states all over the U.S. who are interested in passing appliance standards in 2021, and the work isn't done. If U.S. states passed all these simple all the, a list of the simple standards in our 2020 model bill, um, we could save approximately 16 terawatt hours of electricity, 266 billion gallons of water, and 9 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. So we still have a lot of work to do that standards can, can pull their weight on, and 
I will wait for your questions after our next presenters. Uh, I will cede the floor to Marie Baton. Thank you, Megan. And I will share my screen too. Um, so good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I will um, give you a short overview of the situation in Europe and uh, what we have in the pipe, although it might be a long pipe yet. Um, so if I have control of my own slides, yeah. Um, so I'll give you a short overview of the European context. Um, then I will we'll discuss the current state and the remaining key questions. And we'll shortly talk about the next steps that we're hoping for. So very briefly, uh, for concerning the European context, uh, just in case anyone was wondering, we do have um, a water scarcity concern in Europe. Uh, if you look at, for example, little Belgium that I'm sitting in right now, uh, not really known for uh, the dryness of its climate, but still, um, we do face annual water stress and it has been the case for forever. Um, the, the first little box you see on the left hand side is already from 2012 and I can tell you it has not improved since then. And if we look at the 2050 projection uh, economy first scenario from the European Energy Agency, uh, the situation can get significant, significantly worse for quite a number of, of member states in the EU by 2050. So we need to do all we can to move towards the um, uh, sustainability eventually, as they call it, scenario. And so this is part of it. So we currently do have a few existing voluntary labels in Europe, at the, uh, in Europe, well, both uh, European Union and Switzerland, um, that these are voluntary. And uh, so the, the, the three ones you see uh, on the upper part of the slide are for Portugal, uh, Sweden, and Switzerland. These are so at the national level, uh, voluntary categorical, labels and we also have a voluntary echo label so this one is at the European level but well first of all it, it considers more than um, energy and water efficiency in use the EU echo label looks at basically all stages of the life cycle of products and it hasn't been really used till now so what we are looking at right now in the process I want to talk about is um, the way we typically regulate uh, energy using products and energy related products, including water products uh, in Europe through, um, well, there are two mandatory instruments that we use. It's eco-design and energy labeling. Both of them can cover other aspects than energy. And so the process, well, simplified process because uh, I'm, I don't have the intention of uh, giving you the, the full overview of the European process, but very quickly, we start with an eco design work plan per period of three, four years. Um, then for, so this work plan identifies the priority products for this period that the European Commission should look into for regulation under eco design or energy labeling. And then for each of these products, we, uh, so the commission launches a preparatory study. Following the results of this study, the commission proposes a, well, a draft uh, regulation or like a proposed regulation to the constituent forum, which is basically uh, supposed to represent all stakeholders in, in Europe. So that's industry member states and NGOs. Um, and so again, this is simplified, but um, this constituent forum and the commission um, with like all, all DGs of the commission uh, need to decide whether what is appropriate between energy labeling or eco-design or a combination thereof. And under eco-design, we also have the possibility of a voluntary agreement procedure. Um, again, this is so under the eco design directive there is a possibility to have either a regulation that is mandatory for all products entering the market in europe 
or uh, like self regulation uh, initiative that um, what we call the voluntary agreement procedure procedure there are criteria um, to for this option to be chosen namely um, well amongst others it needs to represent a a very significant majority of the market 80 percent of the market more or less of sales and it needs to be demonstrated that it will be more efficient in reaching the goals than a regulation should be would be sorry so um yeah so that's the third option and uh, in the case of uh, tabs and trial heads i should say that uh, this this product group was identified as the single highest priority and potential in the 2012-2014 eco-design working plan um, the thing is, um, for some reason, they mentioned large savings potential representing an opportunity for a new labeling scheme. So just in passing, the, um, the eco-design option was not suggested by the workman. So that's one of the, um, yeah, that's part of the context that we have to deal with. So the current state of play um, and the remaining question, so as I, yeah, as I was, I'm, I'm just going back to this little diagram that I was presenting. Where we are right now is we still haven't clarity yet, haven't reached clarity yet on which of these instruments is going to be used. Um, but there is a proposed draft, still not complete, a voluntary agreement by industry. And we also would like to consider other options. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. Uh, a few words about the proposed voluntary agreement by the European Bathroom Forum. So uh, that's the that's the industry association basically in Europe. The scope, um, I think it's basically the scope of all hmm, proposals on the table that I discussed right now. So there's no big issue about the scope, just a little lack of clarity. Um, so these the the draft proposal covers uh, taps, including kitchen taps, not bath taps with uh, no shower diverter, because the intention of those is really to uh, fill in the bathtub. So you don't need to. It wouldn't make sense to limit the flow, um, and it does cover also the mixer shower. So like the whole shower system. And the shower outlet separately. The requirements, proposed requirements um, and criteria. So actually you have two um, aspects to this proposed voluntary agreement, both requirements like minimum to be accepted as part of the, the scheme um, with a maximum available flow rate, pressure and dependency where applicable and uh, requirements on the spray coverage. But also, another other aspect of this proposal is a comparative label. Um, I well, I'll say a few words on the next slide about that. So it's uh, the comparative label that is proposed is the same. You have five classes, only based on the flow rate, and it's the same for all products in the current proposal. So the issues uh, we have with the voluntary agreement as the draft is presented at the time being is well there are, there are a few um there are a few gaps uh, and lack of clarity in um well the scope again for example and the the how the scheme would be managed and um and and we have issues more broadly about um the fact that so as I was mentioning, one of the two uh, instruments we have to regulate products you, that, that use energy in Europe is this European energy label, so the little rainbow A to G class that you see in the middle of the slide. This one is mandatory. Once the Commission has decided that it applies to a product, it is mandatory for all products on the market to carry, uh, to display um, this label at the point of sales. If so, and this is managed by the Commission and, and verified by member states, uh, the surveillance authorities, the market surveillance authorities in the member states. If um, 
if we follow the proposal by ABF, um, it's it would be a kind of a voluntary label that looks similar to the European Energy label, but that would not be on all products. So we're concerned that it would create confusion uh, on the market because people would be exposed to both schemes that look quite alike, but uh, don't follow the same rules. And also um, it would be managed by, not by the commission, but by industry. So with less possibility for the commission, sorry, to, 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 to control the quality of the scheme. Also, one thing we want to avoid is um, that the, the top classes in the energy label needs to remain associated. It's, it's pretty similar to what Megan was explaining, actually. It needs to remain associated to uh, products that are quality products in the sense that they perform well on the function that we want them to perform. So, and, and in the, the proposal, as it is right now, there is no um, there is no insurance of that in the sense that there is no rinsing efficiency, for example, um, that the scale is only on the flow. And so we are concerned that they would be, um, that this label might be detrimental to the reputation of the energy labeling uh, more broadly in Europe. So I think we need to introduce some um, measurement of the performance of products. So the next steps to um, either, well, to improve what's currently on the table right now would be, we think to maybe revisit the policy options. As I said, uh, we're only looking at, I could, I, at um, well, not looking at eco-design eco right now, although some of the, well, the requirements that are proposed by, uh, in the draft voluntary agreement could be used as a basis for eco-design. And also an option we have in eco-design is also to require um, information about the products. So that's just information requirement with uh, not necessarily um, a minimum associated to it, but it's a way to, well, start better measuring the market and knowing it so that in the future we can have minimum requirements uh, once we can measure things better and compare things better. So um, yeah, that could be on the table. And well, anyway, address we need to address the gaps that are still existing both in terms of the scope because not all products are covered by well either of the 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 options that we have on the table right now, and in terms of functionality measurements, we think that's um, we are in a kind of chicken and egg situation in the sense that um, we we cannot uh, have requirements in terms of performance because there is no harmonized uh, measurement method, but the commission can only require the standardization bodies to propose a standardization, well, a harmonized method if they have a regulation to base it upon. So we need to break that, uh, that I, we need to break the suit, sorry. Cool. So, um, to solve that issue, uh, the Commission is working on a draft standardization request to send to the standardization body um, that covers um, all the products that we mentioned, tabs, show heads, and the parts and features, like um, including the water brakes and temperature brakes. That's like the little button that you can see on the, the shower bar on the picture. You need to push the button to move to a higher temperature. Um, the boost function, I think the icons are pretty clear in what they mean. Uh, time flow, start, stop, controlled by a motion sensor, and the cold start. Um, so yeah, there's a whole list of all the features that needs to be covered by, um, that would need to be covered by uh, the standardization if accepted. And same thing in terms of parameters that, um, that the standard that the commission would like to see and work on would cover uh, the flow rate, but also, um, well, a lot of the performance aspects that we were discussing. And there are uh, additional aspects for showers. Um, so yeah, it's, there are general aspects and then specifically for showers and specifically for taps. So hopefully um, with that transition request, we would move beyond uh, 
the 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 kind of chicken and egg situation situation that we have been right now measure performance better so that we can um, put a regulation in place and hopefully a mandatory label that would represent the actual efficiency and not only the flow right the maximum flow and that i think that was it so um just like megan i will wait for your questions after the next presentation and i will leave the floor to matt Thank you, Marie. This is Matt Malinowski here. I'm a senior manager at CLASP. And just make sure you can see my screen. Perfect. Good morning, good afternoon. I'll be continuing our discussion uh, by looking at the huge global CO2 reduction opportunity of Taps and showerheads standards and other policies. As Megan uh, shared in her first presentation, and then uh, Marie continued, uh, taps, showerheads, other water products are focused in the US and in Europe. And, and just as a reminder, you know, the, the big benefit of, of specific taps or faucets and showerheads are their um, combined water and energy savings. So in the US, uh, they have equivalent energy and CO2 uh, reduction potential to uh, 12 other products that are non-federally regulated that are being considered uh, for state level regulation while saving, you know, also reducing significant amount of water as well. So they, they really give you two for one, uh, at least in the US. And what we wanted to find out is, um, you know, since it is such a huge opportunity here, could this also apply to, to other countries uh, around the world? Uh, where, as you may know, CLASP works uh, around the world assisting governments in developing energy efficiency policies um, for a variety of products. We wanted to see, could this, could this be another opportunity uh, that governments could pursue? So how do we go about uh, evaluating that, testing that hypothesis? Uh, well, we conducted a global study um, to first prioritize uh, countries or e economies um, to see where, you know, where this would be a, a significant opportunity. Um, then we went more in depth in Brazil, India, and South Africa to to test it out. Will this really play out in pra practice? Um, you know, the desk research might say one thing, but once we actually go talk to uh, policymakers to other stakeholders, we, we may get different ideas. And then lastly, um, crunching all the numbers and, and calculating the water and CO2 potential. Um, before I begin, I'll just want to say this is still research in progress. Um, these are some initial results that we're seeing. We're finishing up with step two, uh, kind of an initial stages of step three here. Um, so, you know, this will this is all you know subject to change and and we're still validating the conclusions but wanted to share this with you nonetheless great so let's look at step one we started by looking at 18 uh, of the top emitting countries um, that have the highest uh, co2 emissions for in the, in the appliance and equipment sector uh, basically, the countries that that CLASP has recently been been focusing on, and looking at the impact factors here on the left, uh, which would be you know how big of an impact CO2, water, um, how big of an impact you could have from policies for showerheads and and taps and faucets or faucets, um, then to try to see how um, achievable those reductions would be. We looked at the policy context. Um, so, you know, are there are there supportive policies that could could enable the government to expand into into these areas? And I'll, I I won't go through those right now. I'll I'll get to that in another slide. But you know, first looking at impacts, and then and then second, are there supporting policies that that could enable the government success? So first, let's talk. Uh, Let's look at the impact factors. How would we evaluate whether uh, policies for faucets and showerheads 
could have a large impact. Uh, first, I think, you know, as, as we discussed, energy, right? Uh, faucets and, and shower heads in the US and Europe, they consume large amounts of hot water. Uh, that water needs to be heated. Uh, in the US, I think it was a Congressional Research Service found that 70% of the energy that's embedded in water is due to water heating. So, so really, you know, Megan mentioned pumping, filtration, you know, those are, those, are, um, those are there, but definitely the bulk of the impacts are from water heating. So, so we try to look at um, statistics uh, for countries that are estimates of the amount of energy that is spent on heating. And there again, you know, the impact would be CO2 emissions and mitigating climate change. Uh, next, we looked at water. Where would the water impacts be greatest? Um, countries and, and regions with um, water stress. And here we're looking both at uh, long-term water scarcity. Uh, so, you know, where the annual withdrawals exceed the resources. So aquifers are being depleted and so on. Uh, as well as short-term water crises. So, you know, where where cities are, are running out of water uh, in the middle of, a, of the hot season or dry season. And this, you know, why it matters, it really addresses a urgent, tangible local need. And we've seen in the US that uh, these kinds of water crises do drive government response. And lastly, uh, we wanted to look at the growing urban population. Um, in all the countries where we've looked at so far, agriculture is by far the main user of water, fresh water. But, you know, it would be really the urban users, the municipal users that would benefit most from faucets and showerhead policies that, that we're looking at. Um, that's, that's where that kind of use, you know, where, where the really water is flowing through those, those kinds of fixtures. So let's visualize it. Um, on this graph, you can see those 18 top emitting um, countries, or I guess in the case of EU economies, um, plotted against the World Resources Institute aqueduct water stress score on the x-axis. It's a zero to five um, score with five being highest water stress. And then the urban growth rate, uh, again, whether positive or, or negative, that's a forecast of 2020 through 2030. The size of the circles or the bubbles is the energy uh, for heating water as estimated by the IEA. Um, you know, based on the impact factors, the, the countries or regions in the upper right would be the ones where water efficiency policies would have the largest impact. And I think, it, you know, no, no surprise there, India, Pakistan are in the top corner, uh, Mexico, Turkey, um, you know, some, some other uh, more arid countries. Um, and, you know, the biggest water users or hot water users uh, you know, I, I, as you can see, it, it kind of correlates with population as well as the, the, cl the, the climate or, or their geography. So China, USA, EU, they're in, in, the, in the middle with the largest circles. Great. So moving on, those are the impacts or the, the countries where policies could, um, you know, do the most good. Looking next at the policy context or where we have success. There we looked at uh, three types of policies. Uh, we started with overarching um, policies that set national targets for water quality and conservation. And these are usually um, pieces of legislation that set the general tone for the country. Um, not very detailed, but they provide mandates for technical ministries to actually do the work of achieving water reductions. Um, and it, it shows that the government prioritizes water conservation, um, you know, has some perhaps some goals around it, and that can be used to drive policy. Second, whether the countries have water efficiency uh, standards and labeling programs already. Um, Megan mentioned this earlier in her presentation in the US, uh, there is a water sense program that that provides test methods and and uh, potential 
levels that then could be incorporated into, into standards. Marie mentioned other labeling schemes, you know, voluntary labeling schemes in, in Europe that, that could that you know perhaps could serve as a template for for a broader um, economy-wide program. Um, and you know, this is definitely something where you know, if there is already a program for um, for water efficiency, it provides a template. It means that government and stakeholders, you know, manufacturers have experience. You know, they 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 perhaps have already had some successes with this. They can serve as champions for an expansion to two faucets, two shower heads, um, or, or perhaps you know more stringent levels. And lastly, we looked at uh, whether the country or region has energy efficiency standards and labeling. So not water specifically, but for other products like refrigerators, lighting, uh, how many policies do they have, how established the program is. And there, you know, again, we thought that this would be, this, this perhaps could serve as a, as a template that um, ministries could apply in the case of water efficiency. So there's some, some overlap in, um, you know, some overlapping experience that, that could be applied. So let's take a look, uh, another look at how, how this uh, applies to the 18 countries and, and, and the EU that, that we, including the EU that we looked at earlier. And in the next graph, I've taken both the policy and the impact factors on one, one graph. So here we have the policy, the impact factors have been combined into a single score. Um, higher means that the biggest impact. Um, each of the previous um, each of the previous impact factors you know, gets a score between zero and two, so going up to six. And then we have these policy prerequisites that we just saw, again, have been combined into, into just a numerical score. Uh, the upper right region is again where, uh, where we're gonna have the biggest, um, the biggest impact as well as the, the highest likelihood of success. Um, you know, maybe not surprisingly, again, India is there, um, Mexico, and so on. So that was our, our template for, for evaluating where do, where do, where do, you know, where can we, where should we be even looking? And then we decided to focus on India, Brazil, and South Africa. And, you know, the, the reason for that was, you know, again, we were looking in the upper right of this graphic, um, we tried to have some geographical diversity. So once we chose India, we decided not to take Pakistan, but look further, further abroad, uh, further afield to other continents, other regions. Um, you know, Brazil uh, being a large country in Latin America, um, and and then South Africa. Um, you know, so in addition to the policies, the impacts, these are also countries where we have worked before. Uh, we have relationships with local policymakers. Um, so so places where we we thought we we personally as, as class could have more, more success. And lastly, you know, the reason we did not pick China, the US or, or the EU, um, you know, despite their, their large impacts um, was, you know, you know, the US and the EU, you know, work is already underway. China also has a, has a robust labeling program that that's, you know, in the past um, decade has expanded into, into water. So uh, we thought that those are well underway. So trying to see, look at new opportunities. Great, so um, that concludes the step one, the prioritization. And next I'll get into some of the initial results from India, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, what, what do the opportunities look like? What might the next steps be? Um, in each of these countries working with a local partner, EDS in India, Mitsidi in Brazil and Solid Green in South Africa, um, as well as our Class Zone India office. Um, and we're trying to see, you know, exactly, you know, what, can this play out? What's the, what's the path forward? What might policy look like for um, faucets and shower heads in these three countries? So let's start with India. India, um, you know, as, as we saw earlier, um, water stress uh, is significant. Uh, per capita water resources are forecast to decline 13 percent uh, over the next five years so um, yeah there'll be you know an eighth less water to, to go go around for every every person in India um, 44 percent of the population have water supplied to the home so that means they, they will have faucets um, and there is growing water heating uh, as you'll see 
in the next, we're still trying to evaluate exactly what percentage of the uh, households have heating, but you know, it, it is something that is growing. Um, you know, storage electric water heaters are the are the main appliance, but you know, there, there are some other technologies as well. And our initial findings are that you know there is a, a water label that's that's in use that could serve as a you know potential template for a national labeling program. Um, you know, there they, they are proposed levels um, that could be could be adopted. You can see you know they go down to the one star is the eight liters, um, and then going down um, to to even lower flow rates. Um, we did not really find, you know, maybe performance testing that, that was mentioned as something that that's important that could that that would need to be um, considered. Um, and also in terms of the reductions potential, you know, our, our initial view of the market finds lots of fixtures that are, you know, 10 to 20 liters per minute, so um, two and a half to five gallons per minute for both faucets and shower heads. So there's lots of uh, products that that are not low flow. So so there could be significant. Uh, reductions potential from this. Uh, moving on to Brazil, um, you know Brazil, maybe not a country that uh, people think of with the Amazon as as being water stressed, um, but it is a is a large country, very uh, diverse in terms of climate, and and so the water resources are not evenly distributed. Um, what's what's significant is that most buildings. Uh, only have a cold water uh, system, so they just have one pipe in the just the cold water pipe in in the walls, and water is heated at the point of use through um, these kinds of instant um, electric shower heads. So you know this may look like a normal shower head, but inside the body of it, you can see it's a, a little wider than than shower heads that uh, you know may be familiar with in the U.S. or, or in Europe. Um, is a, is a we is a basically a resi electric resistance heater, and and the water circulates through that, gets heated at the point of use, and that's the you know that's the the main way that people use heat water in in houses in Brazil, um, and then you know two percent uh, do have gas or, or solar water heaters, so uh, those would be the two pipe uh, two pipe systems. So again, because and, and this this is. Uh, you know, as far as we know, broadly uh, applicable across South America, that that is the main way that, that water is heated in households. So um, when we looked at these electric shower heads as the main opportunity, there there was a labeling program. Uh, they are already very low flow, as you can imagine, for for point of use heating. Um, but you know, perhaps focusing on the performance to um, to ensure that people are are getting the spray force and and the pressure that that's 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 um, that connotes quality. Um, you know, there's also uh, efforts to get flow rates for maximum flow rates for other fixtures into national water standards and testing. Um, you know, getting those test methods in place. And lastly, I'll just touch on South Africa. Um, you know, as, as you may have heard, there ha there there is a is a urgent water crisis in in Cape Town and some other cities. Uh, also, shortfall in national water resources forecast in the near future, um, and a government mandate to focus on water use efficiency. Um, as before, about half the people have water in the home, uh, and a third use water heating. Um, you know, this water heating similar to the U.S. electric storage, but it's such a significant electricity user. This is a main factor in blackouts throughout the country. So. Uh, water efficiency could uh, could help um, stabilize the grid. There, you know, the main effort seems to be including requirements in the national building code. So these are the current uh, requirements that are that are being considered: uh, 2.4 uh, gallons per minute, nine liters per minute for shower heads, um, five liters per minute for bathroom faucets, and and these are the the improvements, the the reductions over the baseline. Uh, water heating, improving just the water heaters themselves, uh, you know, that, that that's another opportunity. So that's just a quick summary of, of some of the initial findings. Um, as a next step, we'll be, you know, validating those and then trying to calculate the, the water and CO2 reduction potential. I, I won't go, go through this in depth, but, you know, we, we put together a model 
uh, based on ASAP's work, on the work of the California Energy Commission um, that considers these different factors uh, to evaluate, you know, what would be, you know, if somebody replaces their fixture, what would be the energy, water, CO2 reduction? Um, as far as the potential path forward, um, you know, we, we mentioned that, you know, there is this pent-up demand for water efficiency because of the scarcity. It's more tangible and immediate than energy. But, you know, there's a lot more complications, too. The countries are fragmented. There are different plumbing systems. Uh, even within a country, um, you know, the, 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 the government ministries aren't always aligned on, on whose mandate this is. And so, in addition to validating these opportunities, some additional ideas might be uh, coordinating ministries, getting a national response, um, you know, working on these individual testing policies, and then lastly, there's an effort at the ISO uh, to implement uh, international water rating and um, so, so both labeling levels and, and test methods. So uh, perhaps participating in that effort. Great. Uh, well, that concludes my presentation. And I'll um, send it back to Vicki. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so much great information presented in all three presentations. And Megan, Marie, and Matt, thank you so much for um, providing you know, this really helpful information. Um, we do have some good questions for you. And uh, just a reminder to our attendees, if you do have questions, uh, please submit them into the little questions box you'll find in the control panel on your screen. Um, but for now, let's begin with um, this first question is, how important is energy embedded in water and the water energy nexus? And um, let's see, uh, there's no specific person uh, this question was addressed to, so I'll just open it up to our panelists to respond. I, I guess I can start, this is Matt with class. Um, I think we, you know, I mentioned in my presentation that at least in the U.S., uh, it was found that about 70% of the energy embedded in water was due to water heating, um, but that that varies region by region. You know, if if you're doing desalination um, or, or, you know, more pumping, more water transport, as may be the case in drier regions, uh, you know, that will be greater. And then, of course, in these countries where, where we looked at where there isn't that much water heating, um, or maybe you know about half the water is heated, um, or half the households have hot water. Period. Uh, you know the embedded energy will be a much bigger deal. Yeah, I, I think that's all. That's a great point. Um, in the U.S., a lot of it is um, uh, dependent on the type of water heating, which can vary uh, considerably region by region. Also, if you like have gas water heater versus electric water heater versus electric. Uh, heat pump water heater um, it the energy embedded is considerable um, but it I mean it also varies quite a bit super great thanks so much um, for those uh, answers um, here's a question um, Megan I recall that you mentioned uh, I believe it is ASAP's bill that people can access and read on your website um, are there um, other resources of information such as reports and other uh, resources that people can access about the work you've all described oh yes definitely yeah uh, um, ASAP's website um, you can find a uh, trove of data on, I mean, we've broken it down state by state as to what the energy and water uh, savings would be for each of the appliance standards that we recommend. And I, I just talked about the water using appliances here, but we've recommended um, 20 different appliance standards. Uh, most of them use energy exclusively, you know, um, air purifiers, that kind of thing. But um, the biggest energy and water saver and money savers tend to be uh, water using appliances, specifically because you're, you're saving energy, uh, you're saving money on your energy bill and on your water bill. So um, if a person on the line is interested, I'm not sure how they could get in contact with me, but if there's an, any resource they can't find um, and they uh, would like to get in contact with me, I would love to um, 
to get in contact with them. Great, thanks so much. Um, Matt and um, Marie, do you have any additional resources you can provide on the work that you presented? Thank you, Vicki. Uh, yes, as I mentioned, our work on the global scoping is, is in progress uh, and should be published uh, sometime over the summer. Uh, and that will be on the CLASP website, clasp.ngo. And as for the European side of things, um, there are some public documents that may not be that easy to find the, the reports by the Commission. Um, and our our comments were mostly directed to the commission. Um, like it, it's they're not so much standalone standalone documents, but rather reactions to the discussions and the proposals. So, um, if anyone is interested, uh, I would be well, just like me, I'm very happy to follow up via email, and I can definitely send links and material. Happy to. Great, thank you so much. And if there's um, anything you want to me to um, send out to our attendees and registrants, uh, I can include that in the post uh, email that goes out tomorrow to everyone. So happy to do that. Um, yeah, if there's a way to include our email addresses, that would be awesome. <laughs> okay, super, I will be happy to do that. So great, great. all right. Um, so each of you talked a little bit about uh, next steps, but still a question on what are the next steps in each of the projects and uh, what is necessary to make those next steps happen? Well, um, I'll start with uh, the U.S. Uh, water efficiency standards. Um, we next steps really are working on uh, getting more support for uh, water efficiency appliance stand water appliance efficiency standards in the in the states. Um, and we've been working really hard on that. We have a lot of really dedicated advocates in um, in uh, many states. Um, and as more and more states. Uh, uh, adopt these standards, then it becomes easier for manufacturers to um, to support a federal standard. So there's sort of like a, a pathway to everybody getting more and more efficient appliances. Um, that's, I think I would call that our next step. Yeah, I can do up a little bit more for you, but as I indicated, next step will be mostly on the measurement side of things. So we we will need to, um, well, to, we'll need the standardization bodies and or <laughs> ourselves, uh, the community here in Europe to come up with harmonized standards that can be used for um, market verification. And so for that, uh, we're gonna start with looking at all the best practices, uh, including what is done in, in the US and um, and try to put together a little task force or something um, because we need um, we need measurements that would be accepted by industry also. So we need to demonstrate that even if it is elsewhere in the world, uh, that we can propose something that that industry could live with so that the commission can use it to support the implementation of uh, the regulations that they would like to adopt. Great, and, and for, for us, um, validating the, the findings with policymakers, uh, other stakeholders, as well as, you know, and, and just demonstrating that these are products that will uh, have similar reductions to ones that are, that are um, already being approached. Thanks so much. Um, Matt, a question has come in for you. Uh, this question is, how big are the possible reductions in primary energy consumptions, such as through terawatt hours, um, and cons corresponding to the water consumption and CO2 emission savings? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's, um, you know, the focus of the modeling that we're doing right now. Um, I don't have numbers quite yet um, as you, as you can imagine it's, it's difficult to um, 
really track down the data on usage on what temperature is coming out of people's taps when they or shower heads when they shower um, so we're we're still tracking all that down uh, validating it um, you know yeah I, I think it's it's I, I don't I, I can't really put a number quite yet but it should be we should have some ideas um, in the summer Great, thanks Matt so much for that. Um, here's a question near and dear to my heart. How will global research work translate into policy? Anyone have a response? Um, Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to take that one as well, at least just to kick it off. Um, Thanks. You know, in 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 the countries where where we're focused right now, um, it I think it's it's going to be one about bringing, you know, these different in, in India, in and it's definitely in Brazil and South Africa, we're seeing different stakeholders, different uh, ministries make um, approach this area area in different ways and, and bringing it all together and, and and making others aware of what's been done in the country and, and as well as abroad uh, could be one way to, um, you know, just to, to, to put some momentum behind it. You know, we've definitely gotten a lot of positive feedback. Yes, this is a priority. This is, this is something we want to be doing. Um, and, and so uh, calling attention to it uh, and presenting some some paths forward that, that may may have worked elsewhere, um, we think could be a path to, to success. Perfect, Matt. Thank you so much. Here's a good question: uh, Global manufacturers, uh, how do you think they will respond to um, these efficiency standards? Anyone oh, it's, have a it's response? yeah. Go ahead. It's it's hard to to respond and on behalf of manufacturers, but I would I would think if there are global manufacturers, um, they might be supportive of some harmonization, at least in countries that are in similar situations. So, yeah, we we may uh, end up talking. Uh, like in groups of stakeholders with the manufacturers from the same companies then in different economies that would be more familiar than others uh, with what we're trying to put in place and that that would yeah uh, see some advantage in global harmonization yeah and I think another thing we've discussed um, before um, has been that you know in other countries it I sort of see it as how uh, individual states can respond to standards. You know, if you have one state that has really good appliance efficiency standards, um, manufacturers might want to sell their less good products in states that don't have those standards. So it become it sort of behooves states to work um, to sort of stay ahead of the game so that their their citizens are getting the best. Um, uh, uh, appliances. So if you have, you know, if the U.S. passes a really stringent efficiency standard, could manufacturers go sell those products in other countries? Um, that would be, I think, a really big motivator for other countries to set similarly stringent standards um, as long as, you know, they meet the criteria that they're, you know, uh, cost effective for consumers. And um, yeah, so I think there's I think I think that's a manufacturer response. Obviously, like we can't speak on behalf of manufacturers, but I think there's um, a good argument in favor of broadening standards beyond, you know, the U.S. to other countries, broadening standards beyond California to other states, that kind of thing. There's you, you want to make sure there's consistency, ideally. Very good, thank you so much. Um, and just kind of a follow-on question to that um, in some regards. Uh, why did, um, 
why was it decided to to focus and select um, your research around taps and shower heads and uh, not other products like, for example, clothes washers? I'm happy to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, go, go. <laughs> Oh, I, I'll just say that um, in the U.S., it's it's pretty clear. You know, we focus on, as I mentioned in my presentation, you focus focus on things that are not federally preempted, but also have um, are also are cost effective for consumers and make a an impact on carbon reduction. So there's sort of a, a trifecta of considerations um, in in globally. I'll I'll let our our um, my other panelists answer. Yeah, so uh, briefly, for, thank you. Um, so the yeah, the situation in, in Europe is that we this presentation was about types and trial heads, but actually we do have um, minimum efficiency requirements and energy labeling for washing machines, for example. Um, and indeed, water is considered and, and heating water is clearly, um, you know, what we we'll look at for efficiency of washing machines. So the 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 limit we have under these instruments is that they have to be energy using or energy related products. So we wouldn't look at, uh, well, uh, toilets, for example, under these instruments because there's no energy in the use, um, like embedded in the water. But well, um, that's not what we would look at under this instrument. But uh, there are energy using and water well energy and water using products that are also considered sure and i can um, touch on this a little bit um, from the countries where we looked um, clothes washers um, you know are either tend to already be regulated uh, or or they don't really use hot water you know i, th I think very many people around the world just just use cold water uh, wash uh dishwashers are, are are not um you know are, are a rarity uh so so these really um would be kind of the the next or the, the first water using uh, appliances um worldwide or fixed you know i mean fixtures but but in in the first products um to actually have an impact excellent thank you all three for uh those great answers i think we have time for one more question. This is actually a two-part question, um, and it is, what are the next logical countries for policy research, and in which countries and contexts would these policies not work? Uh, happy to start on that one, um, and then, you know, Marie, Megan, please, um, please, please um, supplement if, if you if, um, if I miss anything. But I, I think, you know, per our our prioritization framework, you know, we would definitely focus on the countries that, um, you know, with where the impacts can be greatest, right? So, so countries that that either use a, a significant amount of hot water or or that are water scarce, um, and then and then look at the possibility of success. So, um, places with with some of these, you know, breadcrumbs already in place to um, to enable them to act uh, and and address the, 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 those needs, uh, as well as where policymakers are uh, interested in, in working with us. Super, uh, Maria, Megan, anything to add? Um, yeah, no, simply I yeah I just do agree with Matt. Uh, well, I'm just thinking, for example, in uh, on the example of South Africa, we we're currently working on other products, and sometimes you see um, when a country adopts a regulation on a product, you, it can trigger interest from neighboring countries, and so potentially uh, some policymakers from the same region will express interest, and and then these would potentially be the next ones to go for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I support all that. I, <laughs> I, I have nothing. <laughs> all right, great. Thanks, Megan. So, uh, yeah, we are nearing the, the time for the end of our webinar. 
And uh, I just really would like to thank everyone for a great discussion. Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to give all of our panelists an opportunity to provide any you know, final remarks or thoughts. And um, if you do, Megan, I'll start with you. Um, sure, yeah, I, I would just love to, uh, if, if you have any further questions or you want more details on any of the things that I've spoken about, um, feel free to email me and we'll find a way to get my email around to the materials that are sent out after this. Great, thanks so much. Um, Marie? Yes, thank you. Oh, um, also wanted to thank you, Vicki, and, and everybody for attending. And well, basically the same as Megan, I'd be happy to um, to follow up with anybody who would be interested. So please feel free to share my email in the, um, my email address in the follow-up email. And um, yeah, very much so know that we're, we're looking for, um, yeah, all good practices uh, and everything still needs to be defined in Europe. So happy to hear from good practices and interest uh, from anyone. Thank you. Super. Yes, I will definitely be providing emails uh, in the follow-up, email addresses, your contacts in the follow-up email. Um, and Matt, finally over to you, any final thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Vicki, and thank you everybody for, for attending. Uh, as, as this is a, a newish area of work for CLASP, especially you know outside of the outside of Europe, um, we definitely appreciate any um, any organizations or individuals that that would be interested in collaborating uh, with us on this. You know who may have experience or or insights uh, from working in in India and Brazil and South Africa and other countries where where there is a need and uh, potential to. Uh, to have uh, large impacts through water efficiency. So um, yeah, looking forward to um, to hearing from others and, and collaborating with you. Super, great, thanks so much. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to close by extending a gracious thank you to our expert presenters and of course to our attendees. We very much appreciate your participation and we hope you found today's webinar valuable and you're taking away good information that is helpful, not only for yourselves, but others in your network. Um, a quick reminder that a short survey will pop up after we end the webinar, and we just appreciate you taking a minute or two to answer um, this very short survey with the questions. Um, so with that, uh, please all stay safe, be well, and this concludes our webinar. <laughs>